Thanks. Uh, by background, this, this is kind of interesting to sort of motivate where I'm coming from. I sit in a little different role sitting on the practitioner side and sitting, I had a group at, at, at PIMCO really focused on investment solutions and working with our clients to think through things like asset allocation and, and various different, different hedging strategies. The LDI group is part of what I, uh, what I have responsibility for, for at PIMCO. And over the, the past 15 years since I've left Wharton, have seen various different modeling approaches, being at a reinsured investment bank, and now um, PIMCO. And one of the things that I've given more and more thought to over time is in the retirement space, we're looking at very long horizons. And in some sense, this is troubling because we don't necessarily have the data to extrapolate reasonably for the periods we're looking for. And to, to give some motivation, I don't see, is David Blitz, Blitzstein here or, or not here yet? Oh, David's in the back. Um, I'm reminded of a presentation I gave where David was in the audience about a year and a half ago um, to a group. And we were talking about expected returns. And, and I have the, the joy of talking to plan sponsors and telling them that our expectations for returns over the next decade for most pension plans are on the order of 4 to 5 percent, much lower than their expectations of 7.5 or 8 percent. And it talked about our framework for looking at 3 and 10 year horizons. And, and somebody I had said, but we think long term, we think 30 years. And 30 years is a very long time in asset markets. Um, and so I think you know, the crux of the problem when we're looking at making these decisions is we're looking at making decisions that essentially take place and, and bear out over very long periods of time. The other issue we have is if you look at the empirical data on what we do have, asset returns do not appear to be well behaved, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And so the fundamental question that I've asked and thought about over the last 15 years or so is can we do a better job of constructing tools that one, square with empirical research and economic intuition, and two, take advantage of advances in modeling techniques and computing power. Um, and can we do that to design better products and strategies for investors? And you know, this is work with um, a colleague, Nils Peterson, uh, who, who's been very instrumental in helping me think through some of these, these things. Um, so if we look at historic data on asset returns, there's a, a, a wide variety of literature, um, and I'm sure somebody in the audience has probably written something that I've neglected from my um, sparse knowledge of the, of the, of the literature, um, having been a practitioner over the last 15 years as opposed to being an academic. But we, we, we talk about things like fat tails. Extremes happen more frequently than you would expect in a normal distribution. Returns are also skewed. They tend to be negatively uh, skewed in, in most um, most asset classes. They also exhibit positive serial correlation in the short to medium term. So it, for those of you who think about it from the standpoint of an investment strategy, you may refer to this as momentum. And that's been demonstrated in the marketplace, particularly in equity markets, over the short to medium term. And when I say short to medium term, I'm really talking going daily out to uh, three to six months. But on the other hand, if you look at returns over longer horizons, they appear to exhibit longer run mean reversion. And this was first um, brought into the literature by uh, Summers and Kerr Turbo, I guess about 20 years or so again now. And, but it also raises further questions in terms of what we really know. And, and to motivate that a little bit, I, I give you something that comes from data from Robert Schiller, which is uh, 141 years of asset returns. And what the graph's showing is this is the real return on the equity market. Um, and if I take the 140 years and do a full sample average, I get that sort of straight gray bar in the middle there that's a little over 6%. It's about 6.5, uh, 6.6%. .6 but then if I take that same data and I do either rolling 10-year or 30-year geometric averages, for the 10-year geometric average, I get the very volatile dark black line and for the 30-year um, average, I get the, le the slightly less volatile, but still fairly wide-ranging um, dashed black line. And if I look at the range on the 30-year geometric average return, and these are after inflation, I get a range from 3.5% to 10%. And 
To me, that's, that's really interesting because sitting in the seat I do and talking to plan sponsors and reading through annual reports, I see a lot of justification of expected returns on a forward-looking basis looking at the last 30 years. And if I look at the last 30 years, not on a real basis, but on a nominal basis, the highest ex post equity returns actually appear in that last 30 year period. Because this is looking at real returns, but if we add inflation on top of it, inflation tended to be rising over the period and reach its highest. If you think about what happened in the period of the, um, the 80s, we saw a decreasing inflation environment which translated in, into higher expected returns. So the idea of extrapolating based on 30 years data can, can be possibly um, perilous. And um, I, would, I would encourage those of you who think in those terms to think about what are some of the conditioning environments on which you're making return expectations. Um, but the, the main focus of this is, is really to think about an alternative simulation framework that hopefully captures a number of the desired features because the, the topic of this wasn't really thinking about the, the means or conditional means, but really thinking about tails of distributions. And so what Nils and I did, and it's really sort of an extension of something I had done when I was at, at Morgan Stanley, which is take a macro consistent structural model, and there's something called a regime switching model, which I'll talk about in a minute, to build something that gives you more economically consistent and plausible um, returns. And then the idea there is to compare it to more traditional approaches. The most common approach is using a multivariate distribution of returns or multivariate normal distribution of returns. And another approach that we, we commonly use to take advantage of data and capture skew characteristics is a, a method known as a block bootstrap, where you're basically resampling from past data, oper op data um, appearances. The idea then is to take the to take those return simulations and run it through a couple real world um, examples. And the examples we use here are a corporate defined benefit plan with the PPA funding rules um, and look at a 10 year contribution behavior and also a 40 year DC glide path. So to give you some idea of, of the nature of the complexity of this model, there's a, a flow diagram in terms of how we think about it. And what I, I want you to focus on as opposed to the details of all the blocks, is really that first block there, the expansion and contraction. And the idea is based on a paper um, and a set of literature originated by um, James Hamilton that looked at the idea that asset returns or essentially behavior is not necessarily stationary. It may be conditionally stationary, but it may fluctuate across a couple of different states. And Hamilton used it to describe GDP behavior, that you get different dynamics for GDP and an expansion and a contraction. And so the idea here is we have two states of the world um, represented by P and Q. So if I start um, in P, um, there is some probability I will stay in an expansion. Um, with a probability one minus P, I will go from an expansion to a contraction. If I'm in a contraction, there's a probability Q that I will stay in contraction, and then there's a probability one minus Q that I will move. And they're a function of X, because if you do the, the, the simplest model, you essentially have um, properties that, that conditionally on how long you're in, in the state, there's, there's no time dependence. And so we've built it, so there is a time dependence because the, the belief that if there's economic policy at play, um, that will affect the transition probabilities across states. And so to give you some motivation of how this works, and one of the things it's, it's dependent to do is what we have here for looking at the equity models, two different equity risk premium. Um, an equity risk premium that's low um, and relatively tightly distributed in an expansionary state and one that is more uncertain and wider in a, in a contractionary state. So what happens is if I go from expansion to contraction, my equity risk premium goes up, which would necessitate equity values falling. And the degree at which it falls, since I have more uncertainty in my contractionary state, I can get either a very little decline if it doesn't shift that much, but if it moves dramatically, I can get some very big tail events with equities dropping dramatically. Similarly, when I go from contraction to expansion, I can get the opposite effect occurring. And so what is that do in terms of thinking about the behavior 
of our models. Um, you know, we look at a scorecard that, um, that looks at the drawback to this modeling approach is it's not um, intuitively simple to actually think about the model and sometimes it's difficult to calibrate. But if we're trying to get real world economically plausible um, simulations and link them back to economic events, um, it does capture fat tails to a better degree than the structural long term simulation. It could recover similar fat tails and shorter horizons to uh, the bootstrap. Uh, the bootstrap has the, the, the problem, though, that because it captures the short run momentum well, it extrapolates that short run momentum over the longer horizon, which I show you in the examples will give you wider distributions of outcomes. So what this is, and, this, and, and let me explain this slide a little bit, is what we're trying to capture is if I look at the annualized returns across equity and bond markets, um, what I'm not showing is the mean or median of the distribution. I'm really focused on the wings and how wide uh, space do I get in terms of my annualized returns for both equities and bonds. And both, you can see in both cases, for like a one year or very short horizon, the the long horizon simulation model is very close, but over time it captures those features seen in perturbance summers and, and essentially gives you these mean reverting processes that end up with some tighter distributions over very long horizons. So the objective is, is really to run this simulation because the simulation model in and of itself doesn't tell me a whole lot, but dealing with clients, you know, traditionally we're looking at helping clients think through defined benefit plan issues. Um, like an LDI strategy or DC plan strategies like thinking through the design of a, of a of glide path structure. And here we've come up with, with a couple simplified examples. For the DC plan, we've used the, uh, the market glide, glide path average, um, but simplifying them into just equity, fixed income, and, and cash portfolios. And so you see over time, you get the traditional, traditional glide path where equity balances come down. Uh, substantially, and for the DB plan, we've looked at both frozen and accruing plan cases. And so for the DB plan, if I were to compare the, re, the, the actions in the model, in, in the case above, we have a, a frozen plan. And if I look at the bars, the bars represent the distributions it's from, they're really essentially looking at the downside distributions for a DB plan, because the upside distributions, you get to a point where you're fully funded and don't have to make required contributions. What you see is over short periods of time, the models are relatively consistent, but you get this divergence over longer periods of time such that the, uh, the bootstrap is giving you the widest tails or um, the most extreme examples, and the, uh, the long horizon simulation gives you sort of more convergence given this, this sort of nature. And if you think about intuitively, what's going on is over a long horizon, um, over a 10-year horizon, I would expect to see two or three business cycles. Over a 30-year horizon, I would expect to see six or seven. That essentially is a natural self-correcting process in the economy. And by linking the economy to the asset market events, it gives that sort of effect that if you think about it, in the short run, I could have very volatile swings, but over time, I have this effective averaging that goes on that reduces my volatility over time. Uh, results are similar um, in, a DC, in a DC framework where we have um, similar, uh, you know, similar behavior. And I, would, I, I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, all the models are calibrated to have the same mean first and second moments of the distribution so that you don't have distribute differences in terms of the mean and median cases. So some final thoughts. Um, I think it's some interesting preliminary results, but there's a lot of room for future development. We've looked at some very simple cases. Uh, the de desire is to apply it to a broad array of potential applications. Um, first and foremost is looking at dynamic asset allocation strategies and thinking about uh, things like the value of options and, and nonlinear instruments and hedge strategies. And then I think there's also interesting implications for uh, product design across the business cycle. Thanks.